Welcome back to New York City, everybody. My name is Dave Vellante. We're here at the New York Stock Exchange. This is the Cube plus NYSE Wired Media Week, our CXO series. I'm here with Karen Walker, who's the CFO of Sysdig. Thanks so much for coming to the Cube. Thank really you for having me, you. Dave. Great You're to be here. You're very welcome. So, um, wow, the world has changed for you lately. I mean, CFO is right in the center of it all. Um, how do you see it both affecting your organization internally in your role? And then we're going to get into what's happened in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I'm the CFO of Sysdig. We're a cloud security company. And you're absolutely right. It's a very interesting time in cybersecurity. Um, I think that I'd like to say that we're entering a new era of cybersecurity. Uh, there are more attacks. They're more sophisticated. They're faster. And they're unpredictable, right? And when you look at just some of the statistics, they're up about 154% over the previous year. Uh, they can cost on average $5 million, but I would say that mileage varies. So if you look at MGM's yeah. breach last year, they disclosed that it cost them about $100 million. So um, the stakes have never been higher, right? And the regulatory environment is also adding some fuel to the fire there. AI adoption, which I'm sure we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, uh, is another big factor. Um, but one of the things I actually, before unpacking some of that, I'd also say is that, you know, cloud adoption is accelerating. It has been since COVID. It is increasing now, I think, even more with AI adoption. But what I've seen when I've talked to cybersecurity leaders and CISOs is that they've been facing labor shortages now for several years. I think that number is about 4 million in terms of shortage of personnel. So they've already had this massive pressure with a shortage of, of, of a labor. I think skills is another area where they highlight is a very big challenge, like gaps, particularly for cloud security. And then this last 24 month cycle, right, we've been in this sort of macro environment where a lot of people like myself are like looking for, you know, how do we get to profitability? How do we increase margins? And so the macro has not been too friendly for spend, although I would say cybersecurity has been more insulated. Um, there's, there's all of these challenges, I think, that are mounting. I love this conversation. And your observation space is pretty good. You've got 700 customers. You guys participate in, in 40 plus countries as a leader in, in cyber. And the reason I said I like this conversation is because I pay close attention to the macro. You know, they say, if, Absolutely. if you don't get the macro, the macro is going to get you. And right now, if you look at IT spending, it's tracking at about three and a half percent growth per year. I know Gartner and IDC have much, much higher numbers, but it's, I, I don't believe them. Uh, the, the surveys that we have show a lot of caution. And, and a big factor is that 45% of the customers tell us that they're funding their Gen AI initiatives by stealing from other budgets. So it's not like CFOs, your colleagues are opening up the checkbook and saying, oh yeah, here's an extra bunch of dough to go spend on generative yeah, AI. Absolutely. It's it's got to show, you know, some return and it's risky. So people are getting it's not self-funding yet. It's not throwing off enough cash. And so now you're right, cyber's been somewhat insulated, but at the same, right? You can't just say, okay, you have unlimited budget to spend. Correct. Plus your customers, they can't hire enough people. There's a, there's a skill shortage. Now, the hope is that AI can fill some of those gaps, but you, again, you can't just absorb AI overnight. So I'll get to a question. Yeah. Is, um, <laughs> those are great observations, do, Dave. Do you, yeah, thank you. Do you, do you <laughs> see, how long do you think it's going to take and what's that shape of that? It's probably everything's an OGIVE curve, an S curve. How does that, what does that pattern look like in terms of AI sort of filling some of those gaps that we've seen for years? Yeah, great <clears throat> questions. I mean, I'd like to maybe unpack them kind of great. one at a time, one at a time here. You're absolutely right. I've seen the same estimates about cybersecurity spend. Of course, at the beginning of this year, people thought it would be, uh, it would be bigger, a bigger increase, right? But I think we continue to see some of the pressure in the macro, a lot of uncertainty out there. And so 2024 did not turn out to be um, this is the same increase that people talked about at the beginning of the year. Uh, now, when we look ahead to 2025, I mean, you could call it optimism, but you know, there's definitely um, there, there's definitely projections that show an increase uh, head, headed our way that's bigger than 2024 uh, versus 2025. But what I would say, I'd, I'd like to point out a couple of things. I mean, you're absolutely right; it's not a blank check, right? Um, and then you talked a little bit about displacement of budgets and IT for AI. I think that is definitely happening. I've talked to a number of CISOs and C, uh, CI and that is absolutely the case. But what I would say is that um, by and large, 
a lot of the things that are getting displaced are kind of legacy infrastructure. So think more network, more, more firewall and cloud security doesn't seem to be impacted by this. And in fact, I would say that t uh, cloud security should actually be a beneficiary of AI because it's increasing cloud adoption. And of course, then it's, it's really the wild west. I mean, you're gonna have new vulner vulnerabilities. You're gonna have things that really, um, that are gonna be like net new in terms of governance and risks, and also the ability for attackers to use AI to their advantage. So it's gonna be really important for security professionals to do the same, but I think it's gonna be a tailwind, net net. Now, Nikesh uh, Aurora is very fond of talking about how the source of cybersecurity market's huge. I don't know, put a number on 100 billion, maybe more. Um, if you add in all the services around it, it's much, much bigger. But his point is always the leader in the market has you know single digit market share. Um, just maybe Microsoft has more than that, but it's hard to tell. It's so big, with Microsoft. But now I think Palo's over a hundred billion in, they in are market cap. In market so they were cap. the first. That's right. Do you think there will be others to crack a hundred billion in market cap? Absolutely, and I think cloud security is, is going to pave the way. It's going to be a very big market, and I think it's one of the reasons why you see legacy vendors. Um, like Palo um, and you know Crowd, you know basically try to make investments in this space. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are doing it through acquisitions. Some of them are building, but definitely legacy uh, vendors want a piece of this uh, this action. It's something they're calling out on their earnings calls. They're tracking it, and I think you know analysts buy into that. That is basically the future. So coming back to sort of thinking about AI and specifically AI risk. As a CFO, how do you think about risk management generally? What's your framework and how have you adjusted that framework to accommodate AI risk? Yeah, so one thing I would say is you, you cannot have your kind of like head under the covers and sort of like waiting to see how it will all pan out. Like, I think that, you know, businesses need to make investments in AI. There's a lot of experimentation. There'll be like fits and starts, but you have to absolutely you know, figure out, you know, how to unlock some of the productivity and and dive in, right? And I think that CISOs recognize this as well. And I think it's scaring them, right? Because it's like, do I have this, this, the security tools that will keep pace with this? This is going to be introducing new vulnerabilities. It's going to be very challenging from a governance perspective. But I think you'll also have to like, realize that a you know in many places where we look for productivity gains whether it's in go to market or in finance ai can actually help security professionals as well they can help up level the skills um, and they can help them respond faster so two of those challenges i mentioned you know labor shortage as well as um, gaps in skill set i think ai can help with those uh, when i look at our own product it's called sysdig sage um, you know it's been very exciting to see um, how much customers who have used it are excited about it. It's a multi-step reasoning. It has context, it has domain expertise. So when you do think about your investment in AI, don't just invest in sort of a chat bot and a prompt, right? You want to have something that's really truly gonna be a digital assistant. And I think that can really help, uh, certainly uh, help security professionals uh, with those gaps they're seeing. So as a CFO, Karen, how do you think about that? Because I, I I, I see a lot of experimentation going on with generative AI. I see a lot of singles being hit. And I see a lot of experimentation that's actually not really throwing off ROI. Now the spending is maybe not huge. Most companies I would say are in the, if you look at the bell curve are spending you know, less than a million dollars a year on their experiments. But the, some of the big guys are spending a lot, as you know. As yep. a CFO, would you rather see some small quick wins that don't necessarily, you know, quick payback period, you know, maybe a nice ROI percentage, whatever, nice IRR, but small NPVs, or would you rather see longer term paybacks and bigger NPVs? And I know it's probably an it depends question, right. but what do you, what do you, how can you help us like frame how to think about that? Yeah, I think it does depend, but I think, I think that, small MPVs and like experimentation, I think is the way to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so early in these offerings. I mean, we're seeing everything from like net new tools to, you know, uh, some some vendors actually embedding it into their uh, offerings, right? And, and I think the pricing models and all of those things um, have not kind of settled out. 
So I think when I work with our my team, I do look for the ROI, I think, for any investment, right? I mean, we're in that environment where we're, we're, we're trying to make that balance and strive towards profitability and increasing margins. So I think it's absolutely reasonable to say, hey, I want to make this investment. Here's the, here's the business outcome that I'm driving for. And I think that it's just so early. I don't think it would go all in on sort of any long investment. Um, I like more the agility of shorter sprints. So if a, if a business manager who, let's say, Let's say she has some really good street cred and, and, she, and her track record is amazing and comes to you and says, hey, I got this idea, a little bit risky, but I think, you know, this is going to be the future and I think it could be, you know, raise our market capitalization by, you know, a couple hundred million or, you know, bi billion, whatever. Um, how do you look at that? Do you say, hey, I'm not going to write you that check, but if you can fund it, you know, through other ways. What are those conversations like? Do you have, you know, business line managers, whether in your own company or your colleagues or your previous experience that have done some sort of novel ways to self-fund um, and sort of, you know, participate, if you will, in the risk. So it's not all, all on you. I mean, I know right. you're all in this together. Yeah, absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think just like, you know, very much in the culture of tech and like our culture and many yeah. companies, it's it's agile, right? I mean, this isn't, the, this isn't necessarily like, oh, you get this big, you know, bucket of money and you can go on years and years without proving anything right. out. So right, I, right, think right. That, I think that's just like a best practice, whether it's like talking about something transformative like AI or any other sort of investment, you know, kind of having some milestones and understanding like, you know, have you proven it out um, and, and just ha having that agility um, and that discipline to take a look at that. Help us unpack some of these regulations. So we all know GDPR and the California Consumer Privacy Act and. So now you've got all these other, you know, global cybersecurity regulations coming in. There's NIST II uh, coming in. Yep. Um, there's there are other global standards. There have been executive orders. A um, lot of finger wagging by the government at, at industry. Maybe rightly so. I mean, the industry probably could do, be doing a better job. How are you thinking about uh, these regulations? How are you absorbing them? You and your colleagues, in particular. Yeah, absolutely. So I think cybersecurity is is, is is becoming a strategic imperative for both the C-suite and the board. I think that you're right, these regulations have really shown a light on the importance of, of cybersecurity, risk management and posture. So I think that we're starting to see a little bit of a shift. I mean, starting with the SEC rules that was launched last uh, fall. Uh, when you look at those rules, I think they were, you know, they were largely a little bit more of the SEC pushing a little bit harder by saying, hey, you were supposed to be doing this anyway. You needed to be disclosing these risks in your 10K, in your filings. But I think with the 8K rule, and basically you've got four days if you determine that an incident is material to file, I think was a way to make it more transparent, discoverable, and really put the pressure on companies to do so. And it's interesting because when you look at the majority of 8Ks that have been filed, uh, the vast majority of registrants have said um, in their disclosure, this is not material. So it seems like people are kind of err erring on the side of, I'm going to go ahead and disclose because I don't want to be caught afoul as, as these things sometimes do unfold with investigations on an incident. Um, they can look to be potentially not material and then, uh, you know, eventually you determine they are and they could also go the other direction. But it seems like people are kind of erring more on the side of let me disclose first um, and then sort of, you know, be able to sort of use that as a marker, if you will. It's not a self-regulate. I call it running water through the pipes you, know, you get a little muscle memory going and some learnings a little bit and i think you know you mentioned gdpr and i think mm -hmm. you know it took it took some time before we started to see enforcement take place before uh people sort of like navigated to one framework um and so i think with any sort of new regulation it takes time right to settle out and i think it's it's the first starting point but no doubt the regulatory environment is heating up making this a really topic that, you know, is top of mind for boards, um, for C-suite. Uh, NIST 2 is, uh, you know, about to launch in about a week, I think, from now, um, less than that. Um, and that is, um, that is really far sweeping because each of the, you know, 27 member states in the EU um, need to basically transpose this directive into national law. So there could be, you know, different, uh, different provisions that, you know, companies need to follow if they're in France versus Brussels and so on and so forth. So very complex. And I feel it's like not being talked a lot, talked about a lot by U.S. companies. But, um, you know, if you're a U.S. multinational, 
if you're providing a service even, they don't even have to have physical operations in the EU, but if you're providing a service, you're gonna be subject to these regulations. Let's talk about the IPO market for a minute. I mean, we're up here above the New York Stock mm -hmm. Exchange, here in the bell ring in the morning, in the evening. Um, it's, it's such a great experience and it's, it's exciting, it's emotional. Um, how do you think about IPOs? I'm curious as to your thoughts on why the IPO market is so sort of soft right now. I mean, we, during the pandemic, we saw some real blockbuster IPOs. Snowflake in particular was the sort of poster child for successful IPOs. Um, it, but things have calmed down. You know, I, I get election. M&A, um, I also get that, that the sort of FTC and the DOJ have kind of shut a lot of those down. But IPOs market's still pretty tepid. Right. Why do you think that is? As a CFO, how do you think about, you know, IPOs, staying private, like a Databricks is staying, has chosen to stay private. They probably could have gone out. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. They haven't seen an S1. Uh, how do you think about it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think if you if you look back to what, you know, the zero interest rate period, right, that drove like insane valuations, right, and a lot of, I think, small companies, you know, getting out there and doing an IPO, um, not having to show profitability, really just being valued, you know, 100% on revenue growth, like those days are over, right? And so, I mean, we're not going to go back down to zero interest rates, um, you know, even though the Fed has recently cut interest rates and there's some, there's some rates expected, uh, we're not kind of going back to those days. And I think the exuberance that that, that that sort of generated was something that was just, you know, a, a moment in time, if you will. And so to some extent, it's it's a little bit back to fundamentals of having to show profitability. And I think that the pause, I mean, well, one, I think volatility and just like uncertainty in the market has definitely kept people on the sidelines. I, as I understand that the demand is there, but I think with this reset in expectations in terms of being profitable and having a balance of just not all revenue growth, but profitability in addition to just the uh, the size and scale, I think that's required for that. I think really caused a lot of people to play catch up and sort of rethink, you know, what their financial, um, you know, what their financials look like, and needed, to, you know, sort of time to sort of get there. In the meantime, I think there's been tons of volatility, and I think that you know, next year a lot of people are saying there, you know, things will sort of open up. Um, I think there'll be definitely larger scale companies and definitely ones that are either uh, close to profitability, near break even, or already profitable. So the decision point there is if the market's not rewarding growth at all costs, you got to hit the pause button. But of course, as a CFO, if you go out in that climate, and you saw this with Snowflake, it was kind of growth at all costs, the you know, stock went through the roof, ne then the market shifts on them. Yep. And it becomes a, one that's really price sensitive. Um, their their main a main competitor is private. You know they can m maybe you know make some arguments that um, you know they're more cost effective. Who knows? You don't really know their numbers. And then all of a sudden you get caught in this sort of vortex Absolutely. where you're getting whipsawed. So as a CFO, you've got to be concerned about that. Even in in the boom times where where you know had ZERP, but you also had growth growth at all costs, it was being rewarded. So Absolutely. that's got to be a little nerve wracking as a C CFO. Definitely, there's a, there's a number of companies that like that, that, that encountered that, right? Going out like over the summer or spring of 2021, and then we wake up in the fall to a totally different world and had to pivot. And it's much harder to make that pivot when yeah. you're a public company out there in front of everybody, a lot easier to do when you're private. So there's like, I, don't know, I saw a stat, maybe 1200, I don't know if that's the right number of IPOs, you know, in, in waiting. But I guess the point is the quality of those is going to be a main factor as to whether or not they go. And Absolutely. So, so what do you need to be, you know, what do you need to look like to go public today? You've got to, you, you've got to have a, at least a path to profitability. Do you have to be profitable? Do you have to have a free, free cash flow margin? What, I mean, ideally you're profitable, right? Um, hmm. I think that growth is still rewarded, right? right. And it is definitely. Um, you know, a, a larger weighting towards growth than profitability. But I think rule of 40 and like the components of it are, you know, matter. So just making sure the audience understands rule of 40, it's your revenue growth um, plus your um, profit, um, at least equaling 40, you know, 50 is even better. But if you're, let's say, you know, growing your revenue at 100%, but you're like minus 60, you know, on your operating margin or operating uh, margin loss, I don't think that works in this environment. So I think the components matter. So high growth is still important, 
but definitely if you're profitable, that's also important. Uh, so I think rule of 40 is like still very critical and I think is here to stay. So rule of 40 as a sort of baseline condition, revenue growth plus um, operating margin, um, gotta be at 40 yep. plus percent. And you've yep. seen some some companies actually do better than that, like a service now for a while. And <clears throat> some people, sometimes people measure, it's interesting, sometimes they measure free cash flow but I would think non-GAAP operating, well, I guess maybe not. Maybe non-GAAP operating margin is is the right metric, correct? Non-GAAP, right, it operating margin? It, yes, I think it depends yeah. on whether you're a growth company, right, or if you're if you're more va value. Uh, there's companies like, you know, Autodesk that are, are, are valued on free cash flow. So I think, again, it depends on- More it mature. Depends on, exactly. So they can change yeah. the rule of 40 yeah. metrics and- And I think that net retention is actually another one that's super interesting. I mean, it is kind of a, a, a you know, a very common, commonly disclosed metric for SaaS companies. And, you know, I would say, uh, if you're doing like something like 130, that's amazing. But the reality is in the software universe today, that median is closer to 110%. And right. I think that's just a reflection of how challenging the macro is. Today. I've seen I've seen CFOs also <laughs> redefine NRR sometimes, you know, whether they take a different time frame, and right. you really got to read the fine print. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Well, Karen, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Yeah, thanks for having me, It was, great to ha have you. It was um, great. Last question. What do you want to be, to be able to say 12 months from now that you're not able to say today? Oh, let's see. Great question. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to see, I'd like to see like, I'd like to see a return to like companies going public in a healthy market um, and, you know, to see, uh, to see that continued growth, I think as well. Uh, for our own company, um, you know, super excited about um, our offerings and basically what we can do to help companies and help security leaders uh, secure their innovation in the cloud. Uh, looking forward to also, you know, leveraging our AI product and how that can really help solve those uh, those skills gaps and labor shortage that I talked about. So well, super excited about what we're doing. We'd, we'd love to be here at some point um, celebrating the uh, the ringing of the bell with Sysdig. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks, on the Dave. Appreciate Thanks it, for having Ryan. me. You're very welcome. All right, keep it right there. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube plus NYSE Wired, our Media Week CXO series. We'll be right back right after this short break.